let's start by talking about the Senate. So not much has changed, interestingly, since we left this studio right. well, after midnight on, on Tuesday night. We have some more vote totals in. Uh, we know for sure that Georgia, we could put this, put this up, we know for sure that Georgia is headed to a runoff. This will be early December. Last time it was a, a eight, nine week sprint marathon. Gosh. Until it, was, it wasn't until what, January 4th or 5th that the runoff happened. This time it's early December, so it's just a four week sprint. Uh, meanwhile, in Nevada and Arizona are still too close to call, but Democrats are pretty confident that they're gonna win at least one, maybe both of those, depending on what votes come in in, in Nevada. And we can talk about those races in a second, but I'm curious for your take on the effect of, let's say it's not for all the marbles. Let's say by this weekend, we know that Democrats are gonna have at least 50 seats in the Senate. Or Republicans, depending on Nevada. And or or let's say Republicans win them both. Right. right. And so Georgia, this Georgia Senate race becomes a nice to have for both parties, but not deciding the mm. balance of power. Which party's turnout operation do you think that that helps the most? That's a really good question. I mean, I, I think it does depend because if you're a Democrat, you have the tiebreaker, right, in Kamala Harris. Um, mm -hmm. depending on how the numbers shake out, that's that's a, obviously a huge advantage. Kamala Harris is yep. not going to vote the way of Republicans. <laughs> uh, It'd be funny if she did. Yeah, <laughs> she just goes totally rogue. So I think that will matter a little bit, but I don't know. I mean, it's just going to be a ton of money no matter what. It's going to be, because you, even for Democrats, they've been frustrated with the margin that they have right now. And if there's an opportunity for them to pick up another seat, well, to keep Warnock in Senate, in the Senate, um, and increase their margin even by one vote, they'll feel so much more comfortable that it's going to be worth right. the spending. And so, do you think that Republicans, after this disappointing night, which is going to lead to a bunch of finger pointing, uh, already is leading to finger pointing? <laughs> you already have uh, Trump out there making fun of Ron DeSanctimonious for getting fewer <laughs> votes in a midterm than he got as president, as president in a right. presidential year, saying that nobody has ever won 219 seats before. So he's he's going to be stirring the pot for four weeks, which is him stirring the pot for eight weeks in Georgia last time yeah. really hurt turnout yeah. for Republicans. So do you think that Republicans are gonna say, you know, we, were, we thought we were gonna have this red wave. Instead, we got embarrassed. Like, I'm not coming out again for Herschel Walker. Or do you think that the stakes for them are so existential that they're like, you know what, it, I don't, I'm, I'm go, I'm, I'll, I'll, walk, I'll walk through fire for Herschel Walker early December. I think that's what we're going to see. The, the money is going to be framing it very much as that, that this is existential, and I'm sure the Democrats will follow suit because that margin is really important to them. It's not every day mm -hmm. that you have a president and a Senate. You can get a lot yeah, done Democrats with Democrats hate Manchin so much that they would love to be able to make it's him helpful. moot. Yeah, it's it's a neutralizer. Um, and again, it depends on how the numbers shake out. But yeah, I think there's gonna be a ton of money pouring in telling both sides. And in a red state like Georgia, I think that's helpful for Republicans because you have that home state advantage, right? Of people that are generally going to be inclined to say, oh, this is existential in that direction. Now, one thing that the conservative sort of commentariat has settled on over the course of the last couple of days, um, the buzzword is chaos. They have said that candidates like Herschel Walker, Mastriano, Michaels, um, voters don't want chaos. They want a sense of normalcy. And Walker is an example of a chaos candidate. Um, and so I would expect that- people really that, want normal? Chaos is so much more interesting. Well, here's what's really interesting. So my old editor, Tim Carney, pulled out a quote that we got one time during a, a uh, editorial board interview at the Washington Examiner with Thomas Massey. And Thomas Massey explained to us, uh, he, he said he went and campaigned with Rand Paul and Ron Paul, he's a fairly libertarian, um, and it wasn't until Trump came along that he realized, you know, he used to think, wow, all of these people just really love limited government. And he said, I realized when Trump came along, they were just looking to support the craziest son of a bitch in the race. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and Carney pulled that one out and he said, you know, basically, that's what Trump voters want, um, but that's not the entire public, right? So, right. so, so, and especially in some of those districts, we're going to talk about Erie County, for instance. Um, you know, you might have people that 
liked what Trump's chaos was, but nobody else can channel that. Like, there's just no other Donald right. Trump, and it's certainly not going to be Dr. Oz um, right. or Mastriano. Right. End the Fed, don't end the Fed. Just <laughs> make, make me laugh <laughs> yeah. and, and make this party establishment cry, and I'm, I'm happy. Pretty much that, yeah. and, and like, take on the media. Um, yeah. Right, no, absolutely. So anyway, I think that, just expect to see that sort of nudge for Walker to, to not be such a chaos candidate, um, because- well, I'm, I don't know how you do that. Yes, and also how do you do that? I don't know how you, you make do him that. Hide. He's he's one. He has like the he, like how he did in the primary. Yeah, right. I think that's right. So let's put this next element up. Uh, Wisconsin. This is one of the calls that we that we did have after after Tuesday night. It looked like it was headed in this direction. It did go. The biggest surprise here for pundits, um, myself included, mm -hmm. I, uh, was how close it was. Yeah. This and I think that. In some ways, Barnes here was a victim of the massive Wisconsin polling misses mm -hmm. in 2016 and 2020, in that he was able to say, look, I'm up seven points here in these polls. Uh, party doesn't come in and help him. Hey, guys, I'm up four points here. Party mm -hmm. doesn't come in and help him. Hey, guys, this is a dead heat. Party doesn't help him. Guys, I'm only down by a couple points here. Party doesn't help him because they're they keep adding in this extra four or five points that they think the polls are off by. Yeah. Instead, the polls were off in the other direction. Democrats spent something like $72 million in Florida mm -hmm. going after Marco Rubio. Insane. To lose by almost 20 points. Yep. And they left Mandela Barnes hanging out to dry in Wisconsin. Now, you can have criticisms of, the, of, of Barnes as a candidate and the campaign he ran, whatever. He was in, within two points or so. What, what was the- Within what, one point. It's with 99% point. in, we have Ron Johnson at 50.5% and Mandela Barnes at 49.5%. So how do you justify spending $70 million in Florida? You don't. And not, and it's, Florida is so much more expensive to campaign in than mm -hmm. Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. You're from Wisconsin, right? How, how, <laughs> yeah, we're doesn't, cheap. <laughs> doesn't co doesn't cost anything with a Green Bay market or whatever. <laughs> Well, I don't know what they were thinking. I mean, Mandela Barnes obviously is a isn't the ideal candidate in Wisconsin just because he has what you would refer to probably if you're a political consultant as like progressive baggage, baggage. right? Like you, you know, you could they run. They kept showing the abolish ice T-shirt. Yeah, right. that's not helpful, right? Yeah, yeah from a from a, poli a purely political perspective, it's somebody who would have aligned himself with an AOC running in Wisconsin. And again, well, Randy Bryce was there, and Randy Bryce ended up sort of falling flat on his face, um, but. There there's an argument, Jason Kander likes to make it, that if you run sort of boldly on progressive ideas, it's the Reagan formula. If you run boldly on conservative ideas, basically you can win anywhere because people know you're principled. Like people know that you believe what you believe and there's, you know, you're gonna bring some populism into it likely um, and there's a way to do it. You know, Medicare for all, can it win in Wisconsin? Absolutely. Um, but all that is to say, uh, this, even Wisconsin's polling, has been off in a lot of Ron Johnson races, uh, a lot of races in general. So like the Marquette poll that everyone referred to in Wisconsin for a long time as the gold standard of polling. Um, it, it wasn't picking up on a lot of this stuff. And that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit later. But just like, I don't think that any of these postmortems that are saying the polling was okay are right. I mean, I, I think, you know, first of all, polls should be better than okay. Uh, and second of all, I think there were some really, really big misses that just shouldn't have happened, still shouldn't have happened. Is this though, I think the governor's race shows that this, not so not just the one, one being one point away means it's a winnable race. Mm -hmm. That's what they call within the margin of maneuver. Mm -hmm. Like a couple decisions you make differently can can shift those those numbers of of votes, but also you can look at the statewide gubernatorial race. Tony Evers was reelected. He's currently up by about 100,000 votes, 51.2% to 47.8%, and Barnes underperformed uh, Evers. The argument for Barnes was identity, po identity politics based argument that said that Barnes would turn out black voters in Milwaukee, in Milwaukee and also young voters. Mm -hmm. um, in, in Madison, in, huge college right. town. Yeah. In, instead, uh, Milwaukee did not turn out in the way that they predicted it would. Mm -hmm. And Barnes they then significantly underperformed Evers in the rural areas of Wisconsin, which you you have to you're not going to win those as a Democrat, but you have to lose them less bad. Did and that's you see, what Evers did. Well, and and maybe this is a good transition over to the House because that's our our next mm -hmm. block. Actually, let's let's talk well, about this. I want to get your take real fast because yeah. you know Arizona really well. <laughs> yeah. I don't actually. I mean, you know Blake Masters. 
Um, you, you know, we had Blake Masters yes. on, on Rising. Yes. This is somebody whose career yeah. you followed for a long time. Mm-hmm. Do they think they have a shot? Uh, do they have a shot? What's your what's what's your sense at this point? I think they do have a shot. I think they have a path. I think they're projecting optimism about that path that's probably disproportionate to what the reality is. Um, down by five points, which is not right abnormal. Right. Um, yeah, I think Carrie Lake probably has a path, but I don't know that Blake Masters does. Uh, and you know, a good example also, like thinking about where. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, we're, we have a block on the House and the governors mm-hmm. coming up, so I'm trying not to mash them all together. Right. Um, but I, I think you're right that there's there, there's optimism on their end um, about all of that. And Arizona is such a mess. It's right. just, like it is such a mess. The the right there has little faith in uh, the counting, and so basically the right. the prayer is just that this doesn't turn into right. another 2020 nightmare at this point. Um, yeah. And I don't know. And meanwhile, uh, Catherine Cortez Masto is down by 15,000 votes. Uh, but Democrats do think that the votes that are out um, ought to hew her way and that she has a pretty strong chance of Hold holding on. on. It's going to be extremely close um, either way. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.